Hello, this is Talking Europe this week with a look back on some of our reporting highlights from the first half of this year. Well, the big event of early 2019 for us and for Brussels was, of course, the elections to the European Parliament. It's the world's only directly elected transnational assembly with more than 400 million voters eligible this year. Well, one of the big headlines was turnout. More than half of those eligible voters cast a ballot. That's the highest turnout in 20 years. Well, voters somewhat turned their back, however, on the traditional dominance of the centre-left and centre-right, those groups returning fewer MEPs, as did the Conservatives. Meanwhile, Emmanuel Macron's centrists and Liberal allies grew their vote share and the gains as well for the Greens, as well as the far right. Well, during the campaign, our team got out and about around Europe to meet people involved in some of the key stories in their own countries. In Hungary, that saw our reporters meet up with some of the key actors in one of the country's most controversial new laws, labour reforms, that have been dubbed a slave law by critics. This report by Karina Chabour with Clovis Casali. 19-year-old Blanca Nagy visits her parents in a suburb of Budapest. It's the weekend and for once they're not working. They spend 40 hours a week at a Mercedes factory for a monthly salary of 625 euros. But as of this year, their employer can demand up to 56 hours work a week for exactly the same pay. Before we worked Monday to Friday, and if we wanted, we could do extra hours. In general, we accepted, but weren't forced to come Saturday morning or afternoon. In late 2018, the government reformed labour laws. Now bosses can demand their staff work up to 400 extra hours a year. That's nearly one additional day a week. Companies can also delay paying these extra hours by up to three years. Dubbed the slave law by critics, it sparked mass protests across Hungary and Blanca took centre stage. The problem is that for the past nine years, the government has treated us like idiots. We won't let it go. This speech went viral. Soon after, pro-government media ran a smear campaign against the high school student. In my class and in the school, many people want to move abroad. Some tell me they can't imagine spending their future here. In the south of Budapest, a workers' union went on strike against the new law and demanded better salaries. The 3,100 employees of this tyre factory won their battle but are careful not to criticise authorities or their bosses. Our bosses are struggling to recruit in Hungary. So now they're looking at other Eastern Europeans from less developed countries, such as Ukraine. They are even recruiting people from Mongolia and India. Hungarian authorities argue that the so-called slave law should in fact mean more Hungarians and fewer foreigners get work. The national government's motto is that immigration must stop altogether. And Viktor Orbán's spokesman is keen to defend national preference. You have to take care of your own population and your own families first. And again, it's a philosophical difference whether you would like to rely on external resources. The more migrants uh, come to your country, it's going to change the culture and the civilization of the country. We would like to avoid that. We wouldn't like to become a migration country here in Hungary. Orbán's centre-right allies in Europe suspended his party from their group over issues including minority rights and media freedom. But he remains as popular as ever, with polls showing that over half of Hungarians back him in the European elections. Well, as you heard in that report, migration is still a hot-button issue in Hungary. In 2015, during Europe's migration peak, Prime Minister Viktor Orbán installed fences on Hungary's southern border, and he has continued to clash with the European Commission ever since. Well, when our team was in Belgium in April, I spoke to the former Belgian Prime Minister and prominent centrist MEP, Guy Verhofstadt. I asked him if the continuing European arguments over migration were a sign that parties like his had lost the argument on this issue. Here's what he said. Migration has dominated the, the, the political um, debate, but that's because there is a lack of Europe, uh, because we have uh, a crisis 
a migration crisis because there is no European migration policy. But some people say uh, so that we have a crisis because Europe is attracting. No, absolutely not. Uh, we got a, a huge crisis of refugees in Syria. <laughs> that is the war in Syria. And these people uh, have tried to come into uh, Europe uh, to be protected. So the real crisis in Europe on migration is a lack of European Union, a lack of European policies. And I'm pretty sure that besides the uh, populist and the nationalist, it will be the pro-European parties who make this case, this argument, who will win the elections. Well, as someone who is vocally pro-Europe, how do you intend to win voters around to your point of view? By, again, to give a vision uh, of Europe for the future. We are saying that we need a, 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 a reform, a rebirth of the European project and the European Union. Well, a key part of our reporting on the European election was to highlight misleading, distorted and outright fake news stories being put about. Here's one that caught our eyes and our stomachs. This is Fact or Fake, put together by Roxanne Runel. Is the EU messing around with Austrian schnitzel? That's what Austrian Chancellor Kurt suggested early in May 2019 in a statement released to the main Austrian press agency, APA. It's true that the EU does have strict food safety standards, but we couldn't find any about schnitzel. This isn't the first time Europeans' favorite snacks have been dragged into political rows. In December 2017, rumors swirled that the EU was planning to ban doner kebabs. The British newspapers Daily Express and Daily Telegraph were among those to spread the misleading report. In fact, the EU Parliament was considering restricting on health grounds a particular ingredient commonly but not exclusively found in kebabs, phosphates. In any case, the phosphate ban was defeated by a margin of three votes. In the same fatty vein, Belgians have long feared that their beloved fries were at risk of an EU ban too. Cooking oil and methods are well regulated in certain cases, but chip stands don't come into it. Here again, the rumors aren't true. So in summary, no, Austrian schnitzel is not in danger from EU regulations. Your snacks are safe. Well, as the summer wears on, a big task for the EU's heads of state and government is nominating the new faces at the European Commission. In June, I sat down with the current competition commissioner, Margrethe Vestager, the one who's ordered the likes of Google and Apple to pay up multi-billions in fines and back taxes. She told us that a key consideration for those choosing her new colleagues has to be gender balance. When you're in a, in a diverse group, when you sort of break uniformity, in how we look. Very often you also break uniformity in how you think. Uh, you get better discussions, you get better decisions. Uh, you see that very much in, in business and you also see that in political uh, decision making in my experience. Uh, we have accepted sort of informal male quotas of uh, 80, 90 percent for not even decades but for centuries where women have not had the same access uh, to exercising power. Uh, I think it is about time that we get a gender balanced commission. Well, speaking of women being in the frame for top jobs in the EU, Laura Kovesi is an outspoken Romanian who's been widely backed to become the new European anti-corruption prosecutor. Our Europe reporter, Luke Brown, spoke to her in Bucharest recently. He's here with us to tell us a bit more. Hi there, Luke. Uh, first off, who is Laura Kovesi? Well, she's become a bit of a folk hero for many of the protesters who've been demonstrating over the past couple of years. Pretty much everyone you speak to uh, in Romania has something to say and knows her name, which is pretty impressive given that she's essentially just a high-powered and high-ranking lawyer. Now, she was the chief of the National Anti-Corruption Directorate, the DNA, from 2013 to 2018. And the DNA in that time indicted over 50 ministers, MPs, senators and 300 uh, mayors, really giving an idea of just how wide-ranging the corruption is in the country. Uh, she was removed from the post last year by the government. Uh, she was charged with corruption uh, this year. Three out of the four cases have already been thrown out against her. Uh, she says uh, that is simply politically motivated harassment. Let's take a listen. There was always a desire to intimidate me, to harass me and my colleagues. It was a signal that even if you just do your job, then you can have problems. 
We bothered the politicians and we bothered people who occupied important roles in Romania, people with large fortunes. So what's this European anti-corruption job that she's been linked to? Well, Kaveshi herself says she has no political ambitions, but she clearly does have ambitions to be in charge of the European uh, Public Prosecutor's Office, which is going to be a very powerful uh, body which is being launched uh, over the next year or so uh, in the European Union. It's going to be able to prosecute uh, crimes linked to EU funding. Now, Kaveshi herself has the backing of the EU Parliament, but she's being currently blocked by the European Council, which favours the French rival candidate, Jean-François Bonner. Now, the Romanian government has been actively lobbying against her. Perhaps that's unsurprising, given her role in taking down some of the senior members of that party. She, though, uh, insists that she has the experience from working in Romania to get the job done. Let's take a listen. When we talk about fraudulent use of European money and the DNA, we investigated over 2,000 cases every year. I know exactly how the criminals work. And so I also know the methods needed to catch them. Well, just looking a bit more broadly at Romania, it's got a presidential election coming up in November. You've spoken to plenty of Romanians. Uh, what did they say they're expecting or hoping will come out of it? Well, really, the protesters uh, over the past couple of years, they say they really need to build on the progress that they've they've achieved over the past uh, years. They have had an impact with the uh, uh, the arrest and jailing of uh, the boss of the uh, PSD party, Liviu Dragnea, and also the high turnout, higher than expected turnout for the anti-corruption referendum that took place in uh, May. Now, that was organised by President uh, Klaus Johannes. Uh, he is really running on an anti-corruption message in those presidential elections of November. Many people say that the referendum was the first round in those presidential elections and that he strongly won uh, that uh, uh, referendum. Uh, the power, though, is shared in Romania. The president doesn't have that much uh, power. Parliament is still dominated by the PSD party. There are no legislative elections until at least 2021. So the PSD can essentially block any of the major anti-corruption reforms if it wants to. If it wants to, indeed. And our special show from Romania it will be on air on Saturday, 27th of July and online at France24.com shortly after that. Thanks very much, Luke. Please do stay with us. In part two, I'll be sharing some more of your reporting with our viewers, this time from the southwest of Europe, where Portugal is fighting wildfires with trees. Intrigued? You should be. Well, just before we round off part one, then, a topic that has faded from the headlines a bit in recent weeks, but it's likely to dominate the second half of this year. I am talking about Brexit. The UK scheduled to leave the EU on October 31st after it was granted an extension in the spring. Now, whether that will happen with or without a deal is still up in the air and still a matter of great concern for the people Clovis Caselli spoke to in Ireland and Northern Ireland earlier this year. Joe Parker crosses the border several times a day. He doesn't really have a choice. Well, what you're seeing here is my farm in Southern Ireland. And when you look there, straight across the water, there's a misty day today. You mightn't be able to see too well. Just in the other side of the water is my farm in Northern Ireland. Joe regrets not voting in the Brexit referendum as he fears his life will soon change. He's envisaging selling his land in the south if a physical border is set up with all its administrative burdens. Across the bridge in the springtime, maybe 15 times a day, back and forward with vets and different things, and telehandler to feed me animals. That I'm not sure where I lay there with even the sheepdog in the back of the jeep. Is he allowed to come with me? Am I allowed to bring an injection from a vet in Northern Ireland? I don't know. Nobody knows what's down the line, what's coming down the tracks. <laughs> John Sheridan also lives at the border. Our teams met him one year after the referendum. At the time, he described the situation with a pinch of humour. This dog, uh, we, he had no licence to cross the border, so he'll have to go to jail now. He's an illegal immigrant. <laughs> Today, his tone has changed. John knows better than most how torn the region was during the Troubles. He lived through decades of sectarian violence, border checks and humiliations. Sometimes it'd be touchy enough for customs and say, well, I want the whole van cleared out. They could just ask you here at the customs uh, uh, office, to just clear the whole stuff onto the road. And then they'd leave you sitting on the road and you'd have to put the whole stuff back in yourself. Crazy. As we cross this old stone bridge, we leave the Republic of Ireland and enter Northern Ireland. With its British post office, national lottery signs and money exchanges, 
Belcoo looks like any typical UK town. For decades, troops were stationed here and the barracks were attacked several times by Irish nationalists. The violence and killings haunt the local communities. When the customs posts left and the barracks came down, everybody had a sense of freedom which they had never, some of them never before in their lifetime. And we see Brexit just as uh, something which will ruin our peace and has the potential to ruin our economy as well. And, and we don't want one bit of it. The border stretches over 500 kilometres with numerous crossing points used by trucks transporting all kinds of goods. Thomas Murphy often travels to France to pick up apples destined for the Northern Irish market. He's worried at the prospect of a return of customs checks. It'll add hours to delays, to delivery times, cost, extra time waiting, sitting around, pay drivers more money. Everything is just going to be a complete disaster. Food and beverages represent 45% of Irish exports to Northern Ireland. So Dublin looked at ways to cope with the effects of Brexit before the result of the referendum even came in. We receive over 80% of our flour for our baked goods from Northern Ireland. A lot of our beverage companies are actually sending their product up to the north for a centralised bottling and kegging, bringing back down again for distribution. So this is a as much of a supply chain complexity story as it is an export dependency story. 54% of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain in the European Union. And the question of the border has been at the heart of negotiations between London and EU member states. Europe played a part in the 1998 Good Friday Agreement and, like all parties involved, wants to avoid a hard border both in the name of peace and to protect the single market. And we will be picking up on that Brexit theme in part two of the programme in just a few minutes time, as well as to talking climate change, forest fires, bees and more. Hope to see you for part two. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Exactly half a century since Neil Armstrong first set foot on the moon, we bring you this special edition of Inside the Americas from the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral in Florida and ask where to from here for the US space program. Inside the Americas, presented by Tom Burgess Watson on France 24 and France24.com.